are you today? Yay, great. Good more interaction there. All right, before we begin worship, I want to share a quick announcement that uh, Johnny brought to me. Ladies' Night Out. Everybody pay attention if you're a lady. Ladies' Night Out is Monday, November 16th at 6.30 p.m. here at the church. We're going to have supper, a craft time, prayer, and a devotion. But this is very important. Johnny needs you to RSVP to her by Friday, November 13th to let her know if you're coming or not. That way she knows how much food to have, how many crafts to have, and all that. And if you need her phone number, you can text her, or you can call her. You can get that out of the directory, or I'm going to tell you her number real quick. is 405-615-8112. That's 615-8112. So let her know by the 13th of November. Again, ladies' night out is November 16th, okay? And we'll be announcing that again next week, but... Uh, It should be fun. It'll be here at the church and have supper, craft, and a devotion and some prayer time together. All right, let's go ahead and stand, and we'll begin worshiping as we sing the doxology. Praise God from the seated. Now we're going to recognize any birthdays. Do we have any birthdays from this week? Anyone remember? Uh, uh, somebody's getting ratted out in the back there. You got to stand up. You don't have to come forward, so it's not as scary as it used to be. You just let's sing happy birthday. You can just stand right there. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Now's the time you have to say something. You got to speak. Sorry to put you on the spot, but when's your birthday and how old did you turn? On Thursday. Happy birthday. Hope you had a good one. All right. Any anniversaries? Any wedding anniversaries? No? Okay. All right. This time, Brother Brian is going to come up and share. Good morning. We're going to be focusing on Drew Cunningham and his family uh, with his wife Shannon and their four children. They are planting a church. Looks like we got the Rollins up from last last week, but uh, the Cunninghams we're going to be talking about today. So um, they're they're planting a church in Santa Cruz, California, uh, where four than few four percent of the population uh, know Jesus. Just be praying for more laborers uh, sent into the harvest, uh, the Christian conversions in Santa Cruz County, and uh, financial provision. Uh, it's a large family to raise in a, an expensive area. So, uh, Their favorite verse comes out of Luke 10, verse 2. He told them, the harvest is abundant, but the workers are few. Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send workers into his harvest. Let's pray for them. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for their Cunninghams and, and their willingness to serve um, out in Santa Cruz. Uh, Lord, there's definitely a, a need and a calling to uh, teach people and show people the love uh, that you display constantly. Uh, Lord, we hope that uh, their work will be fruitful. Uh, many conversions will happen due to their, their work. Uh, Lord, let us also take that same initiative in our, in our areas where we influence uh, our families, our friends, uh, work, wherever we are. Uh, let us shine for you. It's in his name we pray. Amen. All right. 
continue worshiping now as we sing Serve the Lord with Gladness. Continue worshiping as we sing at Calvary.
together as we continue worshiping and sing, We Will Glorify.
is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. Let's pray. Lord, you are truly great, God. As we see just the majesty of your creation this time of year with the changing leaves and the changing weather and Lord, just the amazing things, everything that you've created, everything you've done, the work you've done in our spirits through your Son, Jesus Christ, God. We just give you praise on your greatness, and we exalt you and lift you up, Lord. I pray now that our hearts are prepared, that you'll open our minds, our spirits, Lord. Help us to receive the message you've given to Brother Andy through your word. God, just move in him with your spirit. Lord, help him to just to communicate the message that you've placed on his heart for us today and help us just to hear it, receive it, repent from it, and draw closer to you, Lord, as, as Brother Andy comes. We ask this in your name. Amen. All right, good morning. Good to see all of you this morning. Uh, those of you that are viewing online later, good to see you guys in spirit. Uh, man, God is good. Right, Brother Herschel? That's right. So in 433 AD, a missionary by the name of Maywin Sakat made his way to Ireland. His objective was to share the gospel with a nation who des desperately needed salvation. The people were lost without hope and without Jesus Christ. During this time, the Celtic High King and the Druids of Ireland followed false gods and false idols, and they had many festivals that were held in their honor. One of these festivals, they lit a fire for the sun god Bel, and it was decreed that no other flame should burn throughout the land for the duration of their festival. However, in direct defiance of the king's decree, Maywin boldly lit a fire on one of the highest hills in Ireland in celebration of Christ, the high king of heaven, and the light of the world. Enraged, the king went to track down who this was that lit this fire along with his army, and his plan was to kill this man. Before reaching the fire, Maywin uh, had messengers that were sent to him to scout out the situation and kind of talk him off the hill, so to speak. If he put out his fire, he would uh, rescue himself, renounce the defiance of the king, and all would be well. However, after listening to the words of the missionary, some of the messengers actually received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And they converted to Christianity. The life of the missionary was spared, and eventually, because of this moment, a revival spread throughout Ireland. This revival was due to God sending one man in boldness. You may know him by his name that he eventually took, which was St. Patrick, who we celebrate on St. Patrick's Day. The word revival has gotten a lot of attention and use lately. It's kind of one of those uh, buzzwords that we use in the Christian community that uh, comes and goes uh, like the latest fashion trends. Sometimes we hear it a lot, other times we don't. And when we do use this word, we, we talk about, man, I wish a re revival would break out. Our, our nation really needs a revival, and right now, <laughs> our nation needs a revival. By definition, revival is an improvement in the condition or strength of something. So in this context, our culture, our church, God's people, why wouldn't we talk about strengthening and improvement? But I think we must be clear on what we mean when we speak of revival. Revival is about change in our world for the kingdom of God for the message of Jesus Christ, for the lost to get saved. 
and to live in the glory of Christ. Listen to what Richard Land, the president of Southern Evangelical Seminary in North Carolina, shares. If we don't have a revival that becomes an awakening and ripens into a reformation, many of us, if we live out our full lives, are going to walk on our streets, in our neighborhoods, drive the roads of our city and state, and oh, the names will be there, but Amer the America we know will be gone. We will be strangers in our own land. We need a revival that awakens, that strengthens, that reforms our nation for the kingdom of God. We are at a critical point in American history, and if we don't get it together, if we don't turn around quickly, then the damage that is done will be irreversible. Turn with me in your Bibles this morning to the Old Testament book of 2 Kings, 2 Kings chapter 13. Over and over throughout Scripture, you see broken people who are in chaos, that are spiritually blind and spiritually weak, who turn from their wicked ways uh, Turn to the face of God, and he not only spiritually heals them, but he spiritually heals their land. And in this moment right now, we all need a revival to break out the likes that was seen back in 433 A.D. in Ireland. Which is why we're here in 2 Kings 13. I've titled this sermon, Ingredients for a Revival. There are three ingredients here, that uh, three things that we are shown, that if we have all of these, then revival is guaranteed to break out. But, but we must have all three of these. Let's read 2 Kings 13. We're just going to read verses 20 and 21. Then Elisha died and was buried. Now, Moabite raiders used to come into the land in the spring of the year. Once, as the Israelites were burying a man, suddenly they saw a raiding party, so they threw the man into Elijah's tomb. When he touched Elijah's bones, the man revived and stood up. Let me pray for us. Father, we come before you, Lord, and this is your time. Father, thank you for uh, allowing us to be together as your people. And Lord, we pray that you will affect the hearts and minds of those that are here, affect the hearts and minds of those that will listen later. And Father, we desperately need you. God, and we desperately need you to speak these words of revival to your people. God, we are in a, in a tight spot right now. Uh, as a nation, uh, as a world, as a culture, and uh, God, we desperately need you to be our focus, our attention, and we desperately need your glory to shine on all of us. And so, Lord, I pray that these words are not mine. I am just your messenger. Father, may you speak uh, to the hearts that are listening, and Father, may you work your will and your way. And it's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. One of my favorite pastimes is to eat pie. <laughs> uh, I, I, uh, I have fond memories, all right? Some of the earliest memories in my childhood are around Thanksgiving or Christmas, and the table is just full of pie, right? Uh, and it doesn't matter what kind of pie. Uh, even if it is my least favorite, all right, which is lemon pie, if that's the only kind that's around, I'm still going to eat it because uh, this style of food, how, I, I just don't have it in me to turn it down. Okay, so here uh, several years ago, my family uh, ended up moving to another state and uh, in transition because of uh, circumstances and logistical reasons, uh, half of us went to one state and the other half stayed in another state. So we were split up uh, as a family. Uh, as if this wasn't hard enough, uh, the real struggle was that I am not a very good cook. I will admit that. Uh, I don't cook well. I don't bake well. Uh, my three things that I can do well are hamburgers, hot dogs, and frozen pizza. All right? Those are like the staples for me. Well, bless my heart, I tried to do better. <laughs> I tried to do better, and I worked on my cooking skills, and I got okay. Uh, we were surviving, and then it happened. 
I got an overinflated ego. And I got real adventurous, and I decided, you know what, I really enjoy pie, and so I'm, go- I'm going for it. It just so happened in our move, I found out that we had cans of pumpkin, and so, hey, I'm going for pumpkin pie. So I gathered all the necessary ingredients, throw it all together, put it in the pie crust, put it in the oven, a lot of time, it comes out, and y'all, I'm telling you, if it was a, uh, uh, entered in the state fair, okay, it would have got a blue ribbon. That's how amazing it looked. But then there was a major problem. It tasted like trash. <laughs> that doesn't even do it justice, okay? It was so bland, I, I can't even describe the issue. It was, it was horrible, and I messed up. <laughs> After some investigation and speaking with my wife, uh, she uh, recommended maybe that I forgot some of the sugar. Guys, I didn't forget some of the sugar. I forgot it all. Three cups of sugar was supposed to go in this thing, and I left it all out. And it ruined my experience. Y'all, that's exactly how it is when it comes to revival. Revival really calls for some very specific things to take place. And we have to have all of these specific things. And so here in 2 Kings 13, we're shown exactly how revival happens. If you want to see the gospel of Jesus Christ take off, if you want to see a light get on fire like that in Ireland, then these three things must happen. And just like the sugar in that pie, if we leave some of it out, uh, it'll, it'll be edible, but it won't be right. The background of these verses here is that of the prophet Elisha. Elisha first shows up in 1 Kings chapter 19 when he has a conversation with another prophet by the name of Elijah. So Elijah comes to Elijah and says, hey, God has spoke to me and you are going to be my successor as the prophet of Israel. And so eventually Elisha does take over. He serves for 60 years leading Israel in kingdom work, leading Israel in the direction and guidance that God leads him. After all his years of service, uh, Elisha contracts an illness, and this is where our scriptures pick up. We are told simply that he, is bur- uh, he dies from the illness, and he is buried. One verse to speak of 60 years of ministry. Elijah's death was abrupt and without fanfare. There is a mention about how there was a celebration of his life throughout the land for this great prophet. Uh, There's not even a a mention of his uh, body being taken back to his ancestors and buried there. We're simply just told that he dies and he's buried. The story then switches almost instantly into uh, another Israelite who has died, and they're having his funeral. And during the funeral service, Moabite raiders come into town. These raiders are looking to destroy, to steal, to cause disruption. They are no friends of the nation of Israel, which is why there's a quick response for them just ending the funeral. And when they throw the man into the grave. It just so happens it's also the same grave that the prophet Elisha was buried in, and when his dead body touches the bones, he's resurrected. What a picture of revival. What an improvement upon and strengthening of a situation for a dead man to come back to life. And this is why God has given us this example in this way. Because he knew that Throughout the centuries, the prophet Elisha and his death would be an example of what revival for us would look like. So if you want to be revived, then this is what needs to happen. The first ingredient for revival is this. If revival is going to break out, it starts with a touch from God. A touch from God. Revival starts with God. It ends with God. It only happens by him. God, through his power, is the only one who starts revival. This dead man in verse 
21 who's being 20 and 21 being buried is thrown in with just the bones of Elisha and comes back to life. He is resurrected not by anything that Elisha did because he's dead as well. It's by the very power of God. Years ago, there was a British evangelist by the name of Gypsy Smith who was asked, how do you start a revival? And this is what he says. If you want to start a revival, go home and get a piece of chalk. Go into your closet and draw a circle on the floor. Kneel down in the middle of the circle and ask God to start a revival inside the chalk mark. When he answers that prayer, then revival has begun. Gypsy was a sincere man of God, and this advice that he gives is solid. Revival starting with you, but it goes much deeper than that. What really needs to take place for revival to happen is for you to go home and get on your knees and pray and pray and pray that the power of God will bring revival. You and I know what it's like to be touched by the power of God. You remember those times that God has touched you with his power. You remember when he started telling you that you needed to accept his son, Jesus Christ. You remember his power and what it felt like when you got saved. You know what his power feels like when he led you to be baptized. You felt his power in all of the prayers that have been answered in your life. You felt his power every time someone accepted Jesus Christ after you shared the gospel with him. God's power goes on and on and on. And when you know what that feels like, you remember. That's the power that was flowing through Elijah's bones that day. And it's the same power that's flowing through every person that's a believer of Jesus Christ today. We just need God to start the work of revival and it will be unstoppable. Bill and Gloria Gaither described this in their song, He Touched Me. They sing, He touched me, oh, He touched me, and oh, the joy that floods my soul, something happened, and now I know. He touched me and made me whole. What a way to describe God's power. Something happened, and now I know. It's a joy that floods my soul. If we're going to have this world turned around, if we're going to turn back to God and get on track with him, then it's only going to be through his power. God brings the joy that f floods our soul. If revival is going to break out in our world, it starts with the power of God. The second ingredient uh, for revival to break out is resurrection has to happen. Resurrection has to happen. That means something that was dead has to come back to life. Somebody has to come back to life, and maybe that somebody is you. Sure, you're physically living and breathing. Right now, by all scientific reason, you are a, a, a live person. But that has nothing to do with revival. If it did, then revival would be happening right now. Change would be happening right now. Revival deals with the spiritual. We have a whole lot of spiritual death around us right now. When a person goes into counseling, many times they'll, they'll go to the counselor with a problem, an issue, a struggle, and the counselor in their wisdom will say, the first step to fixing your problem is to admit that you have a problem. After all, how can a person ever get better if they don't know that there's an issue? We say you can't help those who aren't willing to help themselves, right? Church, we have a problem. Many times we were able to stand behind our pulpits and, and look at the problems out there. And we would say, hey, you can turn on the local news and see all the mess that we are in. You could say, open the local newspaper and you'll see the killing and the suffering and the pain and the brokenness and the sorrow, but no longer is that the best example. Sadly, there's a better example. We don't have to look out there for the chaos anymore. Many of us just have to look at our own personal lives, our own personal families. Broken homes, broken marriages, Busted relationships, hate that is spread, evil that is shared, they've all become normal for all of us. 
and something for all of us to relate to whether we want to admit it or not. Many of us are just flat out broken, and the first step to fixing that problem is to admit that we have a problem. You can't be resurrected if you don't know that you are dead. And just because you have a relationship with Jesus Christ doesn't mean that you still can't be spiritually dead. You may have breath in your lungs, but do you have life in your soul? And it's a good time to look at your life and, and see and do your self-assessment and say, man, is, is, is God speaking to me this morning? And many of you right now are saying, you know what? Uh, I'm doing pretty well. And I agree. There are many of you that are champions of the faith that are desperately needed right now in our world. But just because you're doing well doesn't mean that you're not in the problem. You see, we still have to admit the problem, and the problem is the church. So even if your spiritual life is on track, that doesn't mean that the church is on track. Our churches are failing and we're falling short. We are looking uh, uh, far distant from the bride of Jesus Christ. And if you don't believe that, then look at the numbers, the tail of the tape, if you will. When we look out there and we see the numbers of those that claim to be followers of Jesus Christ, there should be change that is happening. And not just some change, but there should be drastic and dramatic change that's happening in the world. We should be making way more difference than we are, and yet we aren't. One of the reasons is because many of us are acting like there's not a problem. Well, there is a problem, and it's time for the church to get revived and start living as God has called us to live. Here is our hope. Once we admit that we have a problem, then we can move on to the next step, which is doing something about it. We can change our behavior and seek out God's face in the matter and follow after all that he's called us to do. And he will heal us and he will heal our land as we change our behavior, God will show us the what, when, and how. He will show us through his word, through the Holy Spirit. He will show us through our circumstance, through other people. God will show us exactly how we are to live in revival. It's just time for us to get resurrected. So revival starts and ends with God. It's through his power that revival happens. Uh, the next step is we, we live uh, in resurrected lives no longer having to stay spiritually dead and then the third ingredient is this we must take a stand if you want revival to break out in the world you have to take a stand and i'm not talking about taking a stand on your opinion as many of us are doing right now we have a lot of christians who are major religious leaders that are basing everything that they're standing off on off their own opinion. They have caved into the secular world, and even just this past last week, there are religious leaders of denominations that have made decisions that will absolutely crush a lot of the kingdom work that they are trying to do. Satan is in the business of confusing. He's the father of lies. And, and here's the deal. When you have one group of Christians who looks at the list and goes down and says, you know, biblically, all of these things are wrong. But then you have the same list and a different group of Christians that come along and say, you know, everything on that list is not only uh, right, but it's holy. And then they go and say, we should celebrate those things. Why would our world not be confused by what's going on? It's not about our opinion. And yet, as if that's not bad enough, then you throw in your feelings in the mix. And let's just be honest. Not everything in God's kingdom, not everything in Scripture feels good. We are following after God, who sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for the sins of the world. Jesus was perfect, He was holy, He was without blame, and yet He willingly went to the cross to die for the sins of the world. And, and before he went to the cross, uh, his disciples abandoned him. One of his disciples sold him out for 30 pieces of silver. He was mocked, he was ridiculed, and he was beaten into 
uh, an unrecognizable state. The crucifixion alone is something that doesn't feel good. And for many of us, it makes us feel sick to our stomach to think about. And yet people claim that God cares about our feelings. Listen, God doesn't care about your feelings. God cares about your holiness. And it is by all that he calls us to do and the way that he calls us to act and by all that he leads us to that makes us holy. And that is where we are to take our stand. If revival is going to happen, then we've got to take a stand for God's kingdom, not just uh, some of God's kingdom or part of God's kingdom, not just the, the part that feels good or the, the opinions that we have. We have to stand on all of it or we stand on none of it. As we move into the steps of changing behavior that is so desperately needed and all that God shows us to do, that is what we are to take a stand on. Godly principles. Thus saith the Lord. And God has shown us what he says in his word. That's one of the biggest ways that we know what godly principles are is by his word. Over 1,900 times in scripture, it is claimed that the message is from God. Another 500 times the phrase, thus saith the Lord, is presented. These are the words in scripture that are given directly by God. And no matter what lie Satan likes to bring up, he's good at it. For years he's been saying the Bible's full of error, but we know it's infallible. Now he's starting this current trend of, well, you know, with all the translations, this has been skewed, and we have this watered-down uh, translation of the Scripture, and this isn't what the original Greek and Hebrew says. And so Satan's using this as, as a, a ploy to get people to, to downgrade the very Word of God. But the reality is, God's Word is infallible. It is truth. It is not watered down. That's what we should take the stand on. So if God says it's right, then we say it's right. And if God says it's wrong, then we call it wrong. And woe to us if we do anything differently. It is not a matter of opinion or feeling. It is a matter of following after a holy God, taking a stand for all that he calls us to stand for. It's tough. This may cause us to lose friends. It may cause us to have broken family relationships. Taking a stand may even cause us to lose jobs. Or it may even cause us to get in trouble with the authorities. And if you don't believe that's happening in America right now, look at what's happening in the state of California, where churches are told to shut down for the sake of a virus, and when they don't, they get fines placed on them. Being a follower of Jesus Christ is a costly relationship, but what a great relationship it is. If Jesus' own family called him out of his mind, told people that he was crazy, that they didn't know what he was doing, then why would we think that there's any less that's going to happen to us? Following Christ cost. And that cost causes us to take a stand and taking a stand isn't easy, but it's needed, especially when we're talking about this being the difference of life and death. There are massive amounts of people right now in our world that do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And the consequence of that is that they are headed for an eternal hell to be separated for, from God forever and ever. And we have the message that saves them. It is not us. It is the power of God that brings revival. It is the power of God that saves people. But we have the message to share. And we should be doing all that we do. And all that we can. Through his power. Because he's brought us back to life. Because it's important to take a stand. So that his kingdom can receive the glory. So if revival is going to break out, it starts with a touch from God. It is through his power that it will start. 
It's through his power it will continue, and it's through his power that it will uh, see us till the end. If we want revival to break out, then resurrection must happen. Maybe that starts with you. And it definitely needs to happen in our churches. We need to admit that we have a problem and then take the corrective steps to fix that that he leads us to. And last, if revival is going to happen, then we must take a stand. We take a stand on all of his kingdom principles, all that he calls us to stand on. Thus saith the Lord and no more. Power, resurrection, and taking a stand. I'm going to pray for us to close us out. I'm going to ask you to stand this morning. As you are standing, we're going to sing one last invitation. This is your time to respond. Your response is obedience. The altar will be down here uh, open for you to come and pray. You can pray where you're at. If you feel led just to sing this song, then do so. If you need to make a decision, baptism. If you need to get saved, I would love to speak with you. If you just need somebody to pray over you, I would love to do that as well. This is not for you to look around and, and see what everybody else is doing. This is your time to commune with holy God. And so however he leads you, you follow this morning. Let me pray for us. Father, we come before you. Lord, this is, uh, this is your moment where we, we speak to you, all of us, God. We know that you have spoke to us this morning through your scriptures, and we are thankful. Lord, we just pray that you will, you will bless from this moment. Father, I pray for those that are dealing with some really heavy things in their lives, maybe in their families. Father, there's a lot of hurt that's going on, and so will you bring comfort and peace? Father, I pray for those that um, I pray for those that need your Son Jesus Christ. Uh, maybe they're here this morning. Maybe they're listening at home later. Father, th- there are people that desperately need that saving relationship with Jesus. So I pray that you will save them. And Father, as we've spoke about revival this morning, we know across our nation and our world, uh, darkness is heavy. But we know that your light is greater. And so, Lord, we pray that you will let your light shine, starting with your people, so that we can share your glory with those that are around us. And, Father, we pray that you will rescue people from eternal hell and give them eternity, not just in heaven, but eternity with you. Because you are good, you are well, you are amazing, and you deserve it. Lord, thank you for loving us watching over us. And it's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. The cross upon which Jesus died is a shelter in which we can hide. And it's great.
right, great to see all of you this morning. I uh, just want to encourage you guys to have a great week and to um, to live out your, your life in honor of uh, your relationship with Jesus Christ. And I uh, also encourage you guys, Wednesday night, um, we've been having prayer meetings, so if you guys want to come and, and, uh, and gather for prayer, I encourage you to do that. We also have youth activities on Wednesday nights as well going, so um, still a lot happening in, in our church, a lot of good things happening, a lot of good ministry. So, um, so with that being said, uh, we'll ask uh, Brother Kenny, pray for us, close us out, and then, and then lead us in one final song. Lord Jesus, thank you for this day. We could come together as a family, Lord, as brothers and sisters united in you to worship you, to hear from your word, God. I pray as we leave this place, help us to be bold and take that stand that Brother Andy was talking about, God, and, uh, and let your resurrection power flow through us as we love others, love each other, and share the gospel with everyone we come in contact with. We ask this in Christ's name, amen. All right.